Hey everybody, so on the bench today, I've got an Alesis 3630, and while this may not be in the kind of canon of beloved vintage equipment, it is surely a classic, and is probably on just as many recordings as the 1176 that I did a couple weeks ago, so I think it's really worth opening up to see what surprises it has in store for us. Um, let's take a look at the outside first, though. Um, so. First off, you just have to be impressed by the number of features that they have packed into this thing. So it's a two-channel compressor limiter dynamics processor, and you can use it either as a dual mono with it, they each have their own controls, or as stereo with this button. So that's pretty cool right there. Um, and then your typical compressor controls, threshold, ratio, attack, release. Um, and then output makeup gain and then you also have a gate so threshold and uh, and rate for the gate there um, and then they've even packed in some some cool kind of secondary compressor features you can choose to uh, detect either peak or RMS so uh, peak voltage being the absolute top and bottom of the waveform RMS being kind of a, an average of the, of the waveform in any given window. Um, and then hard knee or soft knee, so this is kind of how hard the, uh, the compressor kicks in once it goes over the threshold. Really, really impressive feature set for this cheesy little box uh, because, you know, look at it. It's tiny. It's like, have you ever seen a piece of pro equipment this shallow? It's by three inches so I'm very curious to see uh, how they've packed all that in there uh, but let's take a look at the back first interesting feature here uh, you can switch between minus 10 dBU uh, so which is kind of known as consumer level or plus 4 dBV oh that's interesting I think they might have this wrong uh, usually these are actually specified minus 10 dBV and plus 4 dBU. dBV is a, a peak measurement and dBU is RMS. Uh, I actually think they have this switched here. So that's <laughs> kind of funny. Um, and typical input and output all on TRS jacks here. Um, but they have managed to cram in one more feature which is a side chain uh, send and return so you could send the signal out to a different compressor or an EQ before it gets compressed by the 3630. So you can do your own side chain equalization or send something like a kick drum uh, to duck the signal from a guitar or a synthesizer or something. So a lot of creative uses for that. Props to them for building in that feature. And then we have power coming in on 9 volts AC. Uh, that's... <laughs> You don't you don't love to see that on a piece of uh, pro audio gear, uh, but I'm going to take it apart uh, and we're going to see what awaits us inside. Well, that was extremely harrowing. Uh, that was just the biggest pain in the ass to take apart. What you see here is kind of pretty standard early mid 90s uh, analog electronics. Everything is still through hole. So we're in the era with ICs where you can do so much in a single piece of gear like like we saw in the front panel. But Everything's not so miniaturized and surface mount that you can't tell what's going on. So that's what I like about this is that I can kind of read this just from looking at it uh, at it from here. So let's see. So it, it's kind of weird because it it goes together like this, but that doesn't really show you a whole lot. So I'm going to look at it like this, but these are all the input and output jacks here and then this these are like the front panel meters and stuff, but they're going to be over here. Um, so, you know, first thing I note here is that the input and output jacks only have two metal pins here uh, instead of three, which means they are unbalanced. So 
that's pretty cheesy, you know, in, in a studio environment, gear really should be, should be balanced. So there's a, there's a big corner being cut. Uh, this one is three because it's, uh, it's a send and return for like a Y cable, but that is also unbalanced. Um, another thing I'm noting is that the circuit board is single sided, uh, not, which is not uncommon for that era. So meaning that all the copper is on one side and then in order to make that work, they had to do all these little jumpers, which somebody manually had to put in there uh, to, to bring traces over, over to the top side. Uh, so I don't know if uh, enough if that was a cost-saving thing or if that was just kind of how PCBs were made at this, at this time. Um, another thing that is just very remarkable to me is this switch actuator here. The switch cap. It go <laughs> I guess this, they had to do this for the layout, uh, but the switch is all the way back here, and the front panel's here, so they've got this kind of like long, curving switch cap. I have to imagine that this is a custom uh, injection molded part just for them, and it's same with these kind of plastic covers here. Um, it's just funny. I, it, everything you know, everything changes every ten years or so, and it's just funny to see something that's close enough to the present to be recognizable, but still so so different. You just don't see stuff like this anymore. Um, what else? They've got some clever. Uh, so they're doing some clever shielding here with these little pieces of metal, which go over the jacks and attach to the circuit board. So this is how the ground on the circuit board is mating with the chassis ground of the case. So, you know, there's very solid engineering happening here, but you can kind of see the engineering department and the finance department fighting each other where the, the engineers are like, okay, well, we got to do this. We got to have the right grounding um, or we got to, you know, put this part over here. So we need our own custom injection molded part. And meanwhile, the finance department, I don't know if this is actually how it worked, but this is just how I imagine. The finance department is beating them up on making sure every part is the cheapest thing possible. Oh, can you do a one-sided PCB? Are you sure we can't use a cheaper capacitor? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now let's take a look at the block diagram and then kind of walk through what's actually going on in here. So this is two, two of the same thing. So I'm just going to focus on this top here channel A, because then you can assume it's the same for, for the next channel. So channel A, we come in the input, uh, has a switch between minus 10 dBV or plus 4 dBU. So it looks like they got it right on the block diagram. They must have mis, just misprinted the, uh, the panel. Uh, so the, I imagine that's just, uh, yeah, like it says right here, 0 dB for the plus 4 dBU and plus 11.8 dB for the minus 10 dBV. So they're just basically doing some gain to get you up to pro line level. And then we go to the VCA, the voltage controlled amplifier, which we will talk more about in a moment, but that's basically what does the compression. And then the output uh, for the plus four output, zero dB, so unity gain. And for the minus 10 dBV output, it attenuates that same 11.8 dB that it, uh, it, that it added at the beginning. So pretty simple input vca output um what's going on besides that so right after the input we split out to the side chain of the compressor um and so right right here is your option for an external side chain but that uses a switching jack so that if nothing is plugged in right there signal just goes through all that as if it's just a wire and we get to the side chain and so it's got it split up here between compression detector and control and gate detector and control. So that would include um, everything within that circuitry, the RMS detector, the attack, release, decay controls, etc. all that. And then they use this uh, sigma symbol here to show that they get summed together. So all of our control circuitry is summed together here and sent to the VCA. And so what is a VCA? A VCA is a very clever invention of the, 
well, I'm not sure when it was invented, but it was the late 70s, early 80s when it started to be viable to use them. And it's an amplifier that amplifies AC, which is audio in uh, analog audio. And it is controlled by a DC voltage. And it, the difference between a VCA and other types of compression like BATS or OPTOS is that VCAs have a very precise gain law um, where a specific amount of DC corresponds to a specific amount of gain or attenuation. And so you can be really precise and you can also do something which you couldn't do with FETs or OPTOS, which is use a feed forward topology like this. So if you'll recall from the 1176 video, we actually got we sent the audio to the sidechain from after the compressor. It went so that the compressor was compensating for its own compression. The VCA doesn't need to do that. We can just take it from the input because here we have an RMS detector which gives us a really clear picture of kind of the, the actual size of the signal. And then we can do really precise adjustments of, uh, of gain and attenuation and know what we're going to get on the output. Um, so this is a feed forward topology. Um, and that's basically it. Then there's this switch here to switch between dual, meaning dual mono or stereo. And, and in the stereo one, the two side chains just get summed before they're sent to the individual VCAs. Um, and that's about it. You know, not a whole lot to it. So uh, just to an overview, the audio path for each one goes input, VCA output, and right after the input, the audio goes to the side chain, which includes the compressor and the gate. Um, they do their kind of calculations all in the DC world, and that gets summed together as a DC control voltage, which tells the VCA how much gain or attenuation to provide. Um, okay, now let's go back to the, uh, the actual unit and see if we can see some of that stuff on the board. Um, so I should be looking for, let's look first for these four gain stages here. So I'm assuming those will just be plain old op amps. And, and by gain stages, I, I really mean just four amplifiers. They don't, they aren't all actually providing gain. Um, and so I'm expecting to find a quad op amp or four op amps. And I am seeing so many ICs, you know, look at all these. Um, way more than are in the block diagram. So I can tell you all these are for metering. Um, they have nothing to do with the, the audio path. Uh, isn't that funny? There are way more ICs for metering than there are for audio. So I'm going to go ahead and just take this whole board off because it is not relevant right now. Um, okay, so here are I can see our two channels. You know, this is channel A, this is channel B. Um, Here's our input jack, our output jack, and I see a quad op amp here. So I know it's a quad op amp because it has, uh, I mean, I just, I know the part number and it's got a bunch of pins. Um, so I'm going to assume those are our four op amps right there. Pretty simple. This is the VCA. Um, and then, so that's basically, you know, that's our whole uh, audio path right there. Um, the side chain starts with this little chip here, which is just a dedicated RMS detector. It converts peak uh, values to RMS. And then uh, over here, I'm going to assume the rest of our sidechain stuff is here because I know all the sidechain controls are here. Um, and when you're laying out a circuit board, you typically put stuff close to the things that control it. Um, over here is just all the power stuff, the input diodes for rectifying the AC to DC and then regulators for regulating that voltage. Um, and then the rest is metering. So that's about all there is to it. It's interesting to note what there isn't in here, which is that there are no big parts. There are no inductors. There are no transformers. You know, we're, we're 10, 20 years after the 1176 here. Things have changed a lot. It's still very primitive by today's standards. Um, but you can do all that audio processing that before required these big expensive parts with just these chips. Does it sound as good? Does it, you know, can you, does it really replace the 1176? I think we know the answer to that. 
is no, but that's, uh, that's where we are with technology here. Um, for a closing thought, I mean, I just, you know, this thing is, is a piece of crap. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that. I, I would not, you know, put this on my mix bus, but it's such an impressive piece of, of gear to me for the time, especially, uh, because there really was no, you know, we take the prosumer market for granted now that there's just really incredible gear by 90s standards that we can get for under a hundred dollars. This at the time was groundbreaking because it was, it did the things a compressor and a gate should do. In fact, it does a lot of things and it did it for a price that people at home could afford rather than just somebody who's running a commercial studio. That wasn't always the case. That, that was kind of new with, with Alesis and with this era. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's very much hampered by cost cutting and by the state of technology at the time. But, uh, it's, it stands to me as a very interesting, uh, kind of relic of the period to, to investigate. So hope you enjoyed this teardown. Check out my website, DIYrecordingequipment.com and we'll see you next time.